Come on, come on. Everybody join the Zoom. Do, do, do. Hey, everyone. We're just waiting on, oh, admit. It? And we have. Aloha. Well, then. What's good, Hollywood? Oh, you know, sweating it up in the upstairs room, hot box, Pasadena. Oof. Yeah. That's inland. Good time. Yeah. I was saying earlier, um, we're in dire straits as we only have four cans of sparkling water. Yeah. There, so. How long is that going to last you? Till about noon. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. We'll pound him in the next 28 minutes. But, um, and then were you able to get a hold of, uh, of James this morning? Uh, yeah, I was. He said he'd be here. He's obviously not. That's kind right. of a problem. Easy. Holiday weekend. Yeah. He's, he's kind of important though. He should, uh, he should, uh, should hop on, hop on. I think he has some answers that people would want to hear. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, do you have the questions in front of you too? I do. Okay, sweet. There's a lot of really good ones on here. We'll get to them. Most influencers thing. I'm just wanting to think about. Oh, Limp Biscuits Nookie. Somebody wrote about that one. That's funny. Oh, I want to play that. Writing's not that. Any plans for the UK? Can you hear that? <laughs> Dang, that's thick. <laughs> what a weird era of music. Yes. Yeah. Rap law. That was that would have been a time too when uh I'm sorry. Hey Blake, can I call you back here in a bit? Yeah, no problem. All right, man. Talk to you in a bit. Hey. All right, there's James. Yeah, that was in an era when like DJs in bands were like signed to the record contract. Like, yeah. Five piece band, and one of the band members was a DJ, and he'd be yeah. on the contract. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. crazy. Hey man, welcome. Hey, I finally made it back to the meeting. There you go. I'm so competent that I, uh, I, I was just waiting for you to let me in without even uh, clicking into the meeting. So that's where I was. We were looking for Limp Biscuits Nookie. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Missing out. So are, we, are we live? Are we going? Are we talking to people? We're live. Yeah, yeah we're we're uh, we're recording. So here we go. I, I was just thinking, you know, like this is gonna be really fun because we're gonna be. At, answering a lot of questions and I'm going to be constantly saying like I don't know like when are when are you going to be touring I don't know because <laughs> of COVID like we're trying to figure it out like we're this is what we're doing today is trying to trying to find a way to to be with fans you know yeah right. if you're watching, our mini concert if you're watching this in Poland I guess that technically means we're there right now right so yeah. <laughs> there. It's like how much the musical presidents really matter, you know. Like we're having band meetings, and we're like, how, how do we, how do we keep doing what we want to do? How do we play music in front of people? And like, it's surprisingly hard to do that. Like, like uh, that's where we're doing our mini cons. Is is, uh, and they have to be pre-recorded because, as it turns out, there's there's no way to do it absolutely live on zoom or facebook unless you're all the musicians are in the same room because there's this thing called latency where it just takes a little bit for the, the signal to bounce around between all of the devices and you can't like if, if you're on a zoom meeting or uh if you're on skype with a bunch of people and you try to sing happy birthday it's impossible it's that thing oh. so uh we're trying to figure it out but i i hope that uh some of the questions 
I hope that I can answer some of the questions. <laughs> yeah, let's get into yeah. them. All right. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you everyone for submitting questions to us. There's a lot of really good ones and, uh, and it's, it's just sweet to hear from you all. So Alexis says, do you listen to music similar to what you play or completely uh, different stuff out of left field? Mm. Wow. Well, I personally, I, I like to listen to um, hip hop and sort of like modern stuff when I work out. Um, it's just very, the percussion is very forward and to the point. Um, and so really, I think it's more a question of, of what purpose does pre-recorded music serve in my life? And I think it usually serves as a way to get me starting to lift heavy things. Um, and then, uh, you know, yeah, I, I would say that that's, and that's a pretty stark contrast to the music I end up writing. So that's kind of, that's kind of interesting. Right on. Yeah. Go ahead, Kevin. All right. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm trying to, trying to listen to more music than, than what I'm used to. I find myself going to the same 50 albums all the time. And I know there's, a lot of really great music right now so it's kind of intimidating when it's all available instantly it's like you have, you can listen to literally anything that's ever been recorded and yet i still listen to the same records so if anyone has any good recommendations send them our way yeah yeah uh, I, I tend to i tend to listen to a wide range but i'm kind of like you kevin i haven't even gotten into spotify because mm. it's too overwhelming uh and i think i should because it would introduce me to some more uh, good music. Um, but like I, I go back to Stevie Wonder, I go back to Miles Davis, uh, I go back to Robert Johnson, uh, I go back to some of the Delta Blues that I know. Um, uh, I go back to Modest Mouse, with Sol which Sullivan uh, introduced me to. Modest Mouse Rules. Yeah. And I don't know, more Sheba. I like to play more Sheba. My wife freaking hates that. <laughs> just like take that stuff off and freaks her out. Uh, but I, yeah, so I, I don't know that it would be kind of weird to play just to listen to just the same music that we play because we play kind of a specific music. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I, I think all music is good as long as it's good. And I play and I listen to all kinds of music. Right on. Anyway. Francesca, this is a, uh, asked a question for Sullivan. How long did it take you to learn to play and become so confident um well okay so learn to play learn to play guitar how long did it take for me to learn to play guitar and become so confident and become so <laughs> i know i gotta address these two because there's two separate things i mean i only became comfortable and confident playing guitar and singing at the same time within the last year to be perfectly honest before then i was very focused on recording which means you track everything separately and that kind of what what ends up happening is it, it 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 it's risky because you might end up with a sterile end product, um, and I think that it's really important to be able to at least be able to play the song live on your own uh, mm. before you go and record it. So I would say I guess it took me a decade to get there, which is kind of a long time. Um, with guitar, it came very quickly. Uh, I felt very very confident after about six months. Um, and that confidence bled into other parts of my life because I picked it up when I was 12. And that was just right around the time where, you know, your identity starts to really uh, come into play and, and not solidify, but it starts to kind of come into place. And so that was, it was, it was a good, good time for that. So yeah, so guitar pretty quick. And then confidence, I mean, that's, that's a never ending sort of mission. But uh, if we're going to assume that I've achieved it, I would say that it happened in the last year um, there's a stark difference in my confidence uh, in the years preceding that. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you, went from, you went from being a normal 12 year old who's just discovering himself and everybody at 12 is, is the confidence is still coming online. And then because you got good at, at guitar so quickly, you joined the band Ghost the Robot and suddenly you're like going to Florence to play, you're going to Germany to play and, uh, that must have been a great confidence booster, just personally. It was, yeah, and, and it also keeps the pressure on to try and have your life be as interesting as it was 10 years ago, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, nobody's life is as interesting as it was 10 years ago right now. Mine will be, I swear to God. 
Okay. <laughs> Especially yeah. the past six months. Exactly. Uh, Louie Lou asks, will you visit and tour Australia and come see the beaches of wonderful far north coast of New South Wales? As soon as they let us dirty Americans back in your clean country. <laughs> <laughs> I just yeah. was in Australia though. I was there. Uh, we didn't, uh, did I play music? I think I, I did. I did play music, but not with the band. Uh, and then I almost, I, I I, I came in just as COVID was hitting and everything was locked down. And I remember Tom Hanks had just taken to a hospital like about five miles away from me uh, during that. So uh, yeah, that was my last, that was my last plane ride that was in, the, in the last six months. Yeah. But yeah, as soon as you let us back into the country and I wouldn't do it too soon, but as soon as uh, your government allows us, we'd love to come. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Uh, Gene Caldwell asks, hey Gene. Is there any particular music or song which you have a strong emotional response? Something that's calming, lifts your spirits, makes you sad, or urges you to dance? <laughs> For me, The River uh, by Joni Mitchell, which it's like, the problem is, is that every TV show that makes you want to cry starts playing Joni Mitchell's, Oh, I wish I had a river I could sail away on. Oh, I wish I had a river so long I could teach my feet to fly. I wish I had a river. I made my baby cry, and then then I cried. And and I want a landslide, right? Yeah, but I I swear I this has been my favorite song for years. But recently, every like like five six television shows used that song at the emotional part, and so now I'm ashamed that that I cry at the river. So. <laughs> uh, Tara McKinney asks, McKinney asks, what are your favorite songs? Favorite songs? I mean, I don't know if that's just in general or specifically with the band, but I would say my favorite song right now is Claire de Lune, um, which kind of ties into the last question too. That's a pretty emotional song. Um, it's that Debussy song that's really slow and just makes you cry in like the first 30 seconds. At least that's what it does to me. Um, and then within, within the band's work, I don't know, you have to come back to me on that one, but yeah, Claire de Lune all the way for me right now. Okay. For me, it's, it's whatever I was listening to last that affected me. I love music, so everything, oh, I love that, that's my favorite. And so right now it's opera and classical music because I've been watching um, Mozart in the Jungle mm. uh, on Amazon Prime, and it's all about the New York, uh, New York uh, Philharmonic. And it's an absolute, it's a wonderful TV series and there's great music in it and I'm all into classical music, but I don't know any of the names of any of the songs I've been listening to, but they're my favorite right now. And you, you guys might give me a hard time, but there's a really good record that was put out a couple years ago by Ryan Adams and he covered- No! Yeah, he, <laughs> covered, he covered Taylor Swift's 1989 record front to back. No! <laughs> so he, he took all the songs and just did them as Ryan Adams. And you just realize that they're all just great songs. Yeah. And it's like, oh, yeah, well, they're all, no matter how you serve them, they're just going to be really good. Mm -hmm. I was trying to give you a hard time, and now I feel like a dick. Because <laughs> <laughs> actually, Taylor Swift writes good songs. She does. She sings good songs, too. And Ryan Adams is too. Yeah. Um, the arrangement. Yeah, I, oh. Go ahead. I was going to say this, this, the song and the arrangement are actually two very different things. Mm. You can have the same song and arrange it in a totally different way, you know. Kind of like you can have all the parts for a car, depending on how you arrange them, give you the type of car. It'll seem like something totally different. I think that's what what we've, you know, dealt with a lot in Ghost of the Robot as well. Is like, how, how what's the best way to present these ideas? Yeah. Like, is it, is it super produced with like, you know. A lot of tracks, a lot of guitars. Is it, is it very minimal? Is it stripped down? Is there a drummer? Is there a drum machine? Is, is I'm kind of interested in going, like guys, I, I'm kind of interested in looking for a stripped down sound. Mm. Because we ha we've got, like our first album that Sullivan, you weren't part of, but the first album was a little more stripped down. Uh, just because I was producing it and I'm a I'm a cheap ass, tight ass, and I just go, like, you're done, you're done, keep, keep moving, it sounds great. But it was kind of a raw, stripped down album. And then we got, we, we made a little more money and we had a little more time, we got more highly produced. 
we've been stripping it down a little bit, but I'm kind of interested in, in going just the other way and just stripping it down. Um, yeah. 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 The origins of creativity have like a basis in evolution, right? When there was a problem that people were presented with, we were forced to become creative. So in that sense, restriction breeds creativity. And yeah. so trying to find a way to, you know, purposely sort of restrict or put some kind of interesting parameters around. I mean, the situation we find ourselves in right now is a good example of that, right? We, it's hard for us, we, we can't all be in the same room together. Mm -hmm. And so now we've, we're doing things that we never did before as a band, right? We have these live Zoom concerts and now we're answering questions and online and so, yeah, I think I think restriction breeds creativity in a really interesting way. And then also, I'm really enjoying the the demos. We're sending demos around um, for the next record, and uh, it's just really interesting to think about how how we would do them. Like, how much can we, how much can we do in our living rooms versus you know the need for um, a good you know really you know expensive microphone in a in a sound treated room. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know. We'll see. Do you want to tell the story of that one cut off my iPhone? Yeah, I do. I, and Sullivan, I haven't told you this yet, but I, I was listening to um, to the demos that um, that James sent me, and for for whatever reason, the the track uh, or the the demo for Up on Me yeah. was last, and and I listened to it. I listened to them all in order, and that one was last. And as it came on, um, there was something different about it. And and the, the vocal was much more upfront, and the guitar was was really you know, it was it just sounded like a different recording. And yeah. there's, there's birds in the background the whole time. Yeah. And and I'm thinking, holy shit, this is this is it. This is the master recording. Yeah. Like it, it, there's no way it can be improved upon this presentation of these these lyrics and melodies. So I, I was so excited. I, I called I called you guys straight away and and was like I. You think I don't think I'm crazy, but this like how, first of all, how did you record this? Is it is it done in it by a different method? And he's like, no, I think it's my iPhone. I'm like, well, I don't know what I don't know what it is, but it sounds better. Mm -hmm. And and I think this is it. Yeah. I don't think we need to do anything with this. So I think that's exciting. Yeah. 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 And it does it doesn't need much more than that than just the guitar and the vocal. Yeah. And there's just something really sweet about the the birds too. It's like we couldn't you couldn't ever plan that. No, yeah. Um, or if you did, it would be cheesy. Yeah, yeah it wouldn't, it wouldn't, post production. Would never land the way that it did. But yeah, have have another listen through those through those uh, demos, and then when uh, try to put that one at the end, and imagine it at the end of a of a record. I just think it's yeah. a really sweet way to end. I it. think this. I think it's so cool because one of my favorite albums is Bruce Springsteen's Nebraska, mm. and it's just him and the guitar. And apparently, the story behind that album is that he just he cut some demos in his house. Then he went into the studio and he went through this process of being super frustrated because he couldn't improve on the demos. And finally, he was just like, you know what? The demos are the album. I'm just going to admit it. And I always really respected him for admitting that, like, like recognizing that. Mm -hmm. And I can't believe that, I, that, that we may be in a position where that same thing happens. That's just personally, that's like a little, a little feather in my cap. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we're in the early stages, but that's that's my instinct. At this right, point. the album will come out and it'll be like strings, <laughs> like a whole <laughs> orchestra. We changed our mind. Yeah, we'll, we'll say, oh, I have access to a you know, 18th century <laughs> church pipe organ. <laughs> Can we ruin our songs with this? Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, where are we? Uh, Abby Bernstein. Hi, Abby. Uh, is there anything? You're learning about performance from the socially distant concerts that you would never learned otherwise. No. I'm learning that I'd rather be in a room <laughs> playing with musicians. Yeah. Yeah. You can do a lot. There's a lot you can do. That's what I'm learning. Um, like, you know, just uh, leaving the frame and then re entering the frame. Mm. Uh, you know, that's not like when you're on stage, I guess you could just leave and go backstage or something, but just kind of, uh, I don't know, it, it is, it is, it is very different to not, I mean, there, there's, there's, you can find freedom in, in uh, doing it this way, in an interesting way. Whereas, 
when you're on stage, there's a certain set of expectations and traditions that kind of tend to restrict people's behavior. But with something like this, it doesn't, I mean, there's no real rules or precedents yet. And so, you know, you can kind of just do whatever you want. Um, that's what I've, that's what I've learned. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just trying not to be too precious with it because the thing is it's not live, but it wants to kind of feel a little live. Like we're admitting this is pre-recorded. Yeah. You, you don't want to lie. But at the same time, I, it wants to have a little bit of the feel. It wants to be a little bit dirty so that it, it kind of it's kind of has the flavor of us jamming together and i've found myself learning how to just like just do a few takes and 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 not try to make it perfect you know and if there is a little mistake sometimes that's the fun yeah i think it's frustrating in the, in the first couple takes when i make a mistake on the the last song and it's like, <laughs> I need to go back because it's all you we record it individually in a single take so if it's the last tune you got to play the first two it's whatever yeah. yeah i i always want to play the hard song first for that reason yeah Just, i need to practice more <laughs> yeah uh Annalie israel asks what is the best way to support you to make sure we keep getting awesome concerts and new music buying songs albums of course but what else playing on spotify youtube something else yeah, I, don't know, mm. just I think well we're we are uh we are going to be putting uh, swag up on our uh, Ghost the Robot uh, webpage. Mm -hmm. And that is ghostrobot.com. Is that what it is? Uh, GOTRmusic.com. GOTRmusic.com. So all our swag is going to be there. And we're going to have links to uh, download albums. And then just watching us do this. Yeah. Uh, and uh, getting traffic and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, probably all the things that you're doing already. Uh, and that's that's it <laughs> watch us on your phone a lot yeah and then uh, get our posters and t-shirts when we get them out there's a couple more specific things too that you can do to help us out um if you're watching our content on any platform hitting like i know it seems simple but it really does help us with the algorithm and it helps uh youtube promote it to other audiences the more people that hit like you know the ratio of people watching to the amount of likes you have so the better way to the best you know the, the more you can increase that that ratio the better um spotify doesn't make you know even huge artists don't make money off of spotify or any real money off of spotify so buying actually purchasing the songs on itunes or google play or whatever you listen to is a good way to support the music um and then definitely uh like uh, like pop said uh buying the swag is a uh obviously a really great uh way to support the the band um uh, Doing that, that is the I first time you ever called me pop. <laughs> Pops. <laughs> <I'm a> Pops. <laughs> and to that end, we're we're working on a new site, a new uh, a new bunch of uh, swag and stuff. So we'll have that up soon. Uh, everything's working kind of at a glacial pace with COVID. You know, nothing's yeah. nothing's fast these days. Yeah. Um, we're working on a lot of different things at once, though. Like this is a web. Well, you're working on a lot of different things. But Kev Kevin, Kevin. <laughs> really, uh, uh, Kevin's front loading a lot of the work himself. So thank you, Kevin. Mm -hmm. Kevin. It. Soon. Soon. It'll be up yeah. soon. Uh, Crystal Caputo says, no answer, but love the music. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Jean Caldwell says, how significant is the music in your life to be able to express yourself musically? Well, we can't leave our houses, but we're still trying to do what we can. So it's pretty yeah. important. Yeah. Music is the way that I come into connection uh, with the world. I mean, one of the ways, you know, uh, and it, it's an especially dangerous way to do it for me because when I write a song, it's about stuff that I don't necessarily talk about uh, in normal conversations. So I mean, it's kind of a vulnerable thing to write something very personal and then kind of just throw it out to the world. But uh, that is the most satisfying way uh, to not feel alone. And yeah. so music really deeply helps me feel like I'm not alone. Yeah, and, and in addition to that, I think that uh, music is it's obviously a form of expression, but I kind of liken it to being equal to being able to express yourself verbally. And so my ability to use the English language to convey meaning to other people is of equal importance to my ability to use music, sounds and vibrations to convey meaning to other people, right? And so that's, that's the best way 
I can describe it to people who um, aren't involved in music. It is, it is as important as being able to talk. Um, it is, it's a very different form of expression and it's, it's, it's more efficiently conveys different types of meaning. Um, but, but the things that are expressed by music often are done so because they are not able to be expressed through words. And so that's how it's, it, it is, yeah. So to answer the question, how significant, it is as significant as being able to speak. Yeah, like in musicals, the best musicals have the sense of like, you have dialogue going on. And at the point where dialogue won't suffice anymore, the song starts. You, 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 you can't just talk about what we're going through right now and you have to sing it. And when musicals can do that, it just lifts. And, and, it, and that, those are the ones that really work. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I, that's what I wanted to say. There, I'm done. Uh, Anna Garcia says, uh, where are your favorite places that you have performed in concert? Wow. Florence. Florence. That was sick. The one vote for Florence. Florence was really, really good. I remember uh, I could not get you to leave. We went to see the David and you would not leave. You just refused yep. to go. I thought that was awesome. Like, yeah. nope, I'm here. You can go wherever you want to do, Dad. I'll, I'll catch up with you. I'm going to be here with the David. Yep. You can sit down if you want to. Yep. Um, I remember, uh, well, Kevin, that was years ago. It was one of our biggest shows. We had a huge one in Berlin, too. But there was one in London that I think was like 5,000 people. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was our first or second tour. And I forget the name of that place. It was cavernous. Uh, but that, that was... That was just when when you get above a thousand people, the energy is is uh, it's hard to describe. Yeah, and that many people are into the song that you're singing. Uh, um, I will always remember that, uh, and I'll always remember. Oh, forget all the names of these places we played, man. So there was oh, was it the the hundred in London as well? It was this really famous club? It was a small club, and it only you could only get a hundred people in there. But everyone has played that club. Okay. It was super dirty. Like the backstage smelled like urine so bad. But it was probably David Bowie's old urine, so it was okay. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I had a backstage. Makes it, you know, yeah, pretty, pretty spacious. <laughs> <laughs> What's uh, your favorite, Kevin? Um, I really liked the, uh, some of the convention gigs we did back when. Um, mm -hmm. Just because, like, to your point, the energy... Uh, is really is really tangible and yeah. um, you know people that have a good time I mean I I always say like you know a club that's meant to hold 100 people where they've managed to fit 150 is way more electric than a, a soccer stadium with 2,000 people in it because you know there's just this massive space but uh, yeah it's all about capacity and yeah those and you've played for you've played for huge crowds. Yeah, yeah. There's been some. There's been some uh, with with Lana. We we played the Hollywood Bowl, which is really fun. Yeah, that that holds up. Cause it, it it's funny because as you're walking the stage, they'll they'll have like you know pictures of people that have played the bowl, and like the last one before you get to stage off the off the stage right entrance it, are the Beatles. Like the Beatles oh. played that that oh. stage, and you're like, oh, okay, here we go. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, that's another one. Playing the Cavern is got to be one of my favorites. Oh yeah. And I, I remember when we first played the Cavern, they they put everyone's name up on a plaque uh, outside the Cavern mm -hmm. in a little brass plaque, and they had us right at eye level on the left side of the door frame, which has got to be one of the best places you could possibly have a band. And I'm looking around at at places near the ground that are kind of grunged out because of the street traffic and they're way bigger bands than us. And I asked the promoter, I'm like, after we leave, are you going to move our plaque down to down to somewhere <laughs> else? It's like, no, 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 you, that's, that's your spot. And it's sure enough that second, the next time we played the cavern, we went back and sure enough, ghost the robot was over to the corner. Yeah. I was like, okay, that's, that actually feels better. <laughs> yeah. Cause, cause the, the spot that they had for us was like, Jimi Hendrix was next to that. And yeah. And then, like, what the fuck? Yeah. Like, wait a second. This is, I get it. I get it. Yeah. yeah. I have yeah. pictures from that, actually. Really good pictures of us doing that, that photo op. Um, 
<laughs> uh, Angie says, some songs cover painful life experiences. Performing them, you are reminded of that painful situation more often uh, than without these songs. Does, does the cleansing transmor transformative effect of the creation of the song outweigh the constant reminder at each performance? Yeah, so songs, uh, at least personally, songs lose meaning over time, just to be perfectly blunt and honest. Um, the initial reason that I write a song might be because I'm feeling something that I can't put into words, and so I have to put it into music. Um, but I don't get, so, so, so the part of the question, the, the, the cleansing transformative effect of the creation of the song does outweigh any kind of reminder of the pain that prompted the song to be written in the first place, right? Because the act of writing a song is therapeutic. And then sharing that, it's like, oh, beauty that came from pain. And then now I can share that beauty with other people. Um, and so, yeah, I don't, uh, the initial meaning or sadness or whatever emotion was attached does lose meaning, but that doesn't really mean that the song loses meaning. It takes on its own new me meaning. Um, yeah, it's supposed to be an outgrowth of something. And so once it outgrows that thing, it's on its own and it's independent. Yeah, that's really good. Uh, Cause I, I interact with the songs that I wrote a while ago. Um, and I, I inter it's like I'm interacting with my past self. Yeah. So as I grow, I start interacting with those songs differently than I did a few years ago. Yeah. And it starts to change. Uh, and yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of like talking with your past self. Sometimes I feel like, you know, it, we got through it, buddy. Like yeah. you survived that, You're, we're okay now. And sometimes, it, sometimes it's sweet, it's like a sweet pain. It was a catharsis. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, Georgina Dennis says, so many questions, LOL. I'll try to narrow it down to one. And then doesn't ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, clearly didn't narrow it down to one then. Well, no, well but that's, some, that's some seriously good pairing. Like she pared it down to, to nothing. Yeah, actually, yeah. yeah. I mean, like that, that's amazing. Yeah. If you get a question, just let us know. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll try to do this again. Uh, yeah. Gretchen Lee says, what sorts of activities other than making music do you like to do in your free time? Will you be making other appearances near Pennsylvania in the future? Activities. As far as getting to Pennsylvania, as soon as air travel is not dangerous, like you get, you, you, you read these sites and air travel is high, it, you know, like outdoor dining is moderate to low, air travel high. Not moderate to high, but it's high. So I'm not going to want to get on a plane anytime soon. But uh, activities, I like to work out. Uh, I like, uh, I like, I'm actually liking to watch television more than I used to. I used to not watch any television. Um, I used to just game. And now I'm actually watching, uh, watching good stuff, man. Like I watched Hannah, I watched uh, the, 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 the Tick. That's a funny show. That's a great show. It's about mediocre superheroes uh, produced by a friend of mine. Um, um, I hate to say it, watching television. Yeah. <laughs> or house improvements. You know, just like getting getting around and doing that thing that you always thought you should do around the house and you didn't have time for. Now, now there's just no excuse at all. And you just have to live with yourself. If you don't do it, if I don't do it now, it's just like, dude, you, yeah. you, got, you got no game. You got no house game at all. Yeah. yeah. Kevin, what about you? Uh, we, we have a one-year-old, so we don't have a lot of free time, even, even during a global pandemic. Um, yeah. but it's been really fun hanging out with him a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, he's starting to, you know, he's very fast. He's not walking, but he's, he can crawl so fast and so efficiently. Um, and so hanging out with him, a lot of, uh, you know, we're lucky to have a little garden in our backyard. So I've been doing a lot of stress gardening, mm. um, <laughs> you know, I, just kind of, yeah, would end. <laughs> your garden looks nice. Oh, thanks, man. Improvement. I mean, I haven't seen it since, uh, really since COVID, but yeah. It's, it's a treat. It's a treat to be able to go outside and have some space. I know, I know a lot of people aren't, you know, fortunate enough to, to have that, but yeah. we're really lucky. So 
just being a good steward of it. Yeah, I've, I've been, I don't know, I've been w looking at this ball a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. Let's Look at see that. that again. Oh, that's wild. Yeah, and then the other way, boom. So that that's like five minutes right there. I oh, mean. yeah. <laughs> Um, we'll, we'll have a link to the, the ball of wonder. Um, yeah, I'll live stream just this. Yeah. <laughs> That's a hit. Fascinating. Uh, Carmen Wong says, um, something you hate, but the majority of people seem to love. For me, it's watermelon and bananas. We're really five. <laughs> James goes in, starts throwing shade at Maroon Five. So like, oh man! Uh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I gotta be really careful with those kind of questions because yeah, we're not opening for Maroon Five anymore. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you were gonna have the the twenty twenty two comeback tour, and yeah. and uh, you know. We'll have, to, we'll have to go somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because you answer that question, you get judgmental right away. <laughs> I, guess if I, I should have said bananas because you can't, like, you can throw in shade on bananas. Like, who cares? I, I eat bananas every day. And if you are what you eat, then that means you don't like meat. Mm. Well, that didn't, but I didn't say bananas. The, 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 oh, he's the, using the, an example. The question, the question. Exactly. Yeah. The, person, the person who asked the question, what was her name, Kevin? Uh, Carmen. Carmen Wong. Carmen? Carmen just threw shade on you. That, that yes, she did. I'm literally yeah. made of bananas. <laughs> <laughs> That's banana. Banana man. Look, I, I, didn't really, I didn't really care for Tiger. <laughs> I have one on standby. I cut it in half because I, I didn't want to just be gluttonous. <laughs> <laughs> banana. You say you save your full bananas for sun. Sunday's full banana day. It's yeah, not, yeah. Not loose. It's the Lord's I, day. Yeah. I have to I have to have some self control or else it's just the whole bunch is gone. <laughs> yeah. Um yeah, I I I started to say I d I didn't really like Tiger King. I watched the first episode and I was like, I don't get it. <laughs> these, mm. these people are all idiots and I, I just don't want to <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You can throw shade at him because he's in jail. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. Most of them should be in jail, but I don't know. Uh Anna Evans says, who is your most influential singer or band? Other than the Beatles, um, Jimi Hendrix, probably. Jimi Hendrix, OK. Oh, man. That's a hard one. I, wanna, I guess I wanna... Bruce Springsteen. If I have to choose one, Bruce Springsteen. The boss. Um, I, I really loved, unfortunately, he was, he was a, an early loss to COVID, but um, Adam Schlesinger, so not really a household name, but the, the songwriter of Fountains of Wayne and the guy that wrote That Thing You Do, uh, the song, uh, passed from COVID in, in like April, early, early on. Um, and wow, he's I, young too. Yeah, I think he was uh, early 50s. Um, but just had had a had a crazy body of work, you know. You know, when did did scores for lots of TV and film, and um, yeah. So I I I really think that he was, um, you know, he had a lot more to say. So I I'm gonna I'm gonna give him some kudos in this moment and say, Adam. Uh, Angelique Coppola says, "What is your guilty pleasure song? One that you crank in the car when no one is there." Mine is Limp Biscuits Nookies. So we were listening to this earlier because I saw. We were. Like, we were here. I can see it. Uh, thank you. Next. I'm so. Wait. Oh. That's mine. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> it all goes wrong again, Everclear. Yeah. Okay. I'm almost not guilty about it, though. They rock. I just can't yeah. take a whole album of Everclear because it just bashes you on the head with every single song. Mm. Every single song is like that. Yeah. They, they, have, they have one gear, and it's 12th gear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Mine is uh, uh, Love Fool by the Cardigans. Is that guilty like, though? Every time I hear that, no, it's, it's brilliant. It's like the best of like 90s Swedish pop awesomeness. And it's, it was, uh, yeah, made for the Romeo yeah. and Juliet soundtrack, I think. I find it. I want to hear it. We play I'm everything. trying to find guilty. I don't, oh man. The Cardigans, Love Fool. It's such a good song. Does Cage the Elephant count as a guilty pleasure? Oh, they're awesome. Hey, Jack. Right? Carpenters, The Cars, Cass Stevens, Adele Davis, Chaka Khan, Citizen Cope, The Clash, Clem Snide, Coldplay. I guess that's becoming a guilty pleasure. Coldplay? But, yeah, these days. <laughs> the oh, we're not going to open for Coldplay. God. <laughs> no, I'm okay with that. I'm, really, I'm never able to get on board with Coldplay, to be honest. Well, early Coldplay. <laughs> that's really was good. What's that? It said Rush of Blood to the Head is a brilliant album. Yeah, that's a great mm -hmm. album. Yeah, that was before really good. Parachutes, right? That's probably, what, 2005? Yeah. But um, Crowded House, The Cure, Dave Matthews, David Bowie, Doobie Brothers, The Doors, Dusty Springsteen. I, I don't have any guilt. I'm like, I love it. It's good. Yeah. You like it, you like it. It's hard to be guilty. Yeah. OK, I guess Everclear is the closest thing I got. But Limp Bizkit's Nucky, that's, that's a good, you know, yeah. That's strong. A really good example, yeah. Uh, Stacy says, what kind of process do you go through when you write songs, and what are your favorite songs to perform? Mm. Mm. I just find that it leaps out of me. Mm -hmm. It just, something wants to come out, and it, it doesn't leave me alone until it's out. And until I write it down, I'm just consumed by it. It's almost painful. Um, my favorite song to perform, I guess it would be, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm weak because my favorite songs are the ones that don't hurt as bad. Sometimes when I sing songs that are really personal, I'm afraid I'm gonna cry and you cannot sing and cry at the same time. So it's always a little dangerous. So maybe like Katie, you know, where you know the audience is just gonna like pop up and everyone's gonna have a good light time. Mm. Um, yeah, <laughs> those are easier, so I guess maybe Katie, yeah. Yeah, I, um, it's music first for me. Uh, lyrics do not come first. I procrastinate really hard on lyrics, actually. I mean, I will, I will wait until the day I'm recording it to finish the lyrics, which is not advisable, but I just, I communicate with the, with the music um, initially. And then, yeah, it's not really, it's not like I, I'm walking around, I mean, sometimes, I would say a good 30% of the time, I'll have a melody in my head that just needs to get out. And it's just there and it keeps happening, it keeps happening. And it's just some kind of rearrangement of things that I have heard before. But, you know, I'll hear a melody, it's like, oh, well, that melody's cool, but what if like the last 25% went in this direction? Mm -hmm. And then suddenly, you know, just subconsciously, your brain starts reorganizing it. But more often than not, it's really, if I'm playing guitar a lot, I write more songs. There's a direct correlation and I think it's causal. I think that, um, you know, the more I play guitar, the more you, you know, maybe come across this chord progression that's crazy cool. And then that fits the melody in your head that you were thinking of earlier. But I think it's really, you gotta be, for me, I gotta be playing my instrument consistently if I want to consistently write songs. Um, and then the songs that I like performing with Ghost Robot are things like Truth Is that are a bit more free form and then allow me to just do crazy loud solos. That's, that's what I like to do live. It's very fun. I agree, yeah, the ones that have uh, a lot more that we can, you know, expand upon from when they were recorded Yeah, are a lot of fun. Yeah, I agree with, I agree with both y'all. It's, uh, you know, sometimes melodies are just there for a long time and you think, wait a second, that, that's not someone else's song. That's, that's something that's just been, you know, building. You yeah, know, your own space and so I have so How many long did it take you to write the melody for issues? Sorry? You wrote the melody for issues, right? Yeah, that one, uh, you know, I, I love, uh, you know, simple, simple pop and it just sort of worked over those, those chords. I mean, I'm, I'm a sucker for a, a, a major, major third, you know, because it's just so, it's so, uh, I don't know, I just, I put it in everything. It's like, yeah. Just, just sprinkle major thirds all over the yeah. place. Like and, uh, 
and yeah. dominant hits and it's just fun. Yeah. All right. Uh, Lisa, we have like 15 minutes. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. Lightning round. Lightning round. Yeah. Well, might be tough. We've, yeah. I have, there's a lot of really good questions here. So yeah. we'll we may have to do this again. Yeah. We may have to, yeah. Uh, Lisa Jones says, it's a rite of passage for kids to go through and play their, play their parents' record collection. What artists did you find in their collection and which ones, if any, influenced you and did you incorporate into your own music collection? My, I had a stepfather who had the most awesome record collection, hundreds of records, uh, and he introduced me to Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, he introduced me to um, Edgar Winter, uh, to Joni Mitchell, to Stevie Wonder, uh, a lot of the Beatles, actually. And he had great taste in music. Um, and he had a great record player. It was a long time ago, so it had tubes and everything. But it was just, it was so awesome. And uh, I, I was a teenager, and I wanted to find that music that, um, that he wouldn't like. So it could be mine because everything I brought to him, he'd be like, oh, I dig on that, you know? And I wanted that, I wanted that rebellious music. And I finally found it in Bob Marley when he said, that's really good, but all the sound, the songs sound the same. And I was like, yeah, close enough, man. That's my music. Well, what, what, what music did you find? Yeah, it's, that's, I, I like the way this question is, is phrased because it's kind of like the kid has to go find it on their own and it's not, necessarily going to work if the parent says this is what you should be listening to son you know mm -hmm. and so i discovered the first time i discovered like good music what i think of as good music is i was actually on my mother's ipod shuffle while i was playing we in 2008 and the song help by the beatles came on it was like help i need somebody do, do, do. and it was just this driving thing and i was like whoa that's that's just very like to the point and direct and like just impactful. Um, and then, you know, later on, I would go through my parents' um, iTunes thing with all this like, they, they just burn CDs from their friends and, and put it on and I would find uh, different music. Um, but, uh, you know, my, my dad introduced me to things like the Ramones and sort of grittier, uh, music that occurred more recently than the stuff that I, I initially discovered music through 60s music, right? Um, and then Charlie came along and showed me 90s and 2000s stuff. Um, and then I started to pick up on the 2010 stuff on my own. But, um, but yeah, it's definitely, I, I like the way the question's phrased, because it's gotta be, you know, it's gotta be you that discovers it. It can't be directly handed down to you. Um, what I think. Yeah, my mom was way into Neil Young. I'm like, she, yeah, it was just great. She, yeah. and, and at first you're like, you know, this is whack. I want to listen to Limp Biscuits and Nookie. And then now you're coming back to it like, oh no, this is this is really good stuff. She was right. Yeah. <laughs> um, Aaron McCormick says, what song was the most challenging song you ever wrote or played? Mother Apparel. Oh yeah, that one's that one's a trip. Um, I wrote the guitar for that when I was twelve, and it wasn't really meant to have lyrics. It was just meant to be like, "Hey, everybody, I can do all these cool things on the guitar. Look at me." <laughs> and then that meant that when you try and do something like that live, or you try and do something like that all at once, it it becomes hard. Especially because then Charlie came along and wrote some lyrics to it, and we added drums and expanded on a couple of sections and it is to say that it is a demanding piece is is an understatement i actually right. had somebody come to us up to a convention and say oh how do you play mother apparel like expecting me to just teach them and you know five minutes real quick just show them you know <laughs> it's it's that one's that one's demanding yeah for me it's like a waterfall which we've never recorded or, or we've never played as a band it was on one of my solo albums and uh it's, it's, it's probably as complicated, it would take Sullivan like five minutes to master, but for me, it's one of the hardest one for me to do, yeah. Is the bass, you pick out the bass each time? Yeah. Yeah. Dun, 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 good at that though, I don't, I don't think dun, 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 dun. Yeah. Um, Challenge song I ever wrote or played, I don't, I don't know. Um, 
I love a good challenge. So I'm not good at answering that question. Mm -hmm. uh, Steven says, I know James and Sullivan have names for their guitars. What about the other guys? Um, I don't have names for my guitars. They're just, there's a couple in there and there's a couple in the closet. Yeah. I'm, a couple I'm is an understatement, Kevin. You have many, many names. <laughs> <laughs> many. How many do you have? How many, how many bases do you have? I think, I think I'm down to like nine. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And why do you have nine? Do you play them or is that just? I, I just sort of hoard them. Like, like some people hoard cats or plants. <laughs> I, just, I just need to, to give them shelter and attention. <laughs> and you say down to, is that like, so was there a high number that was more? Yeah, there used to be more. Um, I sold a few when I got off the road, you know, a lot. And uh, I had all these like, you know, big road cases and stuff I didn't need anymore. So um, yeah, it's, it was a lot. It was, it was an impressive amount of bases, but. Um, How many? How many? I, I don't, I honestly don't know. I think, I think really? It was, like, it was probably north of 15 at some point, but. Okay, okay. But uh, I, I honestly can't give a, an accurate number. 15 plus or minus three. Yeah, okay. I can't complain, honestly, because like, I don't have to buy any guitars because I know that my bandmates have. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we've done our shows down here and like don't bring anything i got all the i got all the shit just just get here and then we'll figure out the gear later yeah yeah because so much so much of being a, a working band is like it's just your your stuff like there's so much stuff that you need and and it's like well we, we're gonna play this club like do they have the right stuff or do we need to rent stuff or do we need to buy more stuff and then we have it and, and so you just start accumulating just stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yep. tools. <laughs> yes. Ooh. Necessary. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, Tara says, question, how is James still so gorgeous? Moisturizer. Yep. Moisturizer. Yep. Uh, uh, Cindy Crawford's Meaningful Beauty. It's cheap. They mail it to you and it freaking works. Cool. We should get a sponsor from them. Yeah. I know. Brought to you by. <laughs> also, lighting helps a lot. <laughs> the natural, natural lighting. Yeah. Um, Michelle asks, will you be coming to the UK for a show? If so, where will you be playing? Probably London. Probably London. Probably. Oh, yeah. I liked Edinburgh. Edinburgh was really fun. I would like to go back to, I would like to go back to that bar that we played in Wales on our second tour. Kevin, you weren't prepared. Yeah. That uh, Tom Jones's brother, I think it was his brother's bar, and yeah. that, I remember um, he. It was in the middle of the summer, and it was it was above hundred degrees, and the guy turned the heat on inside the club on that day to sell more drinks, and I remember looking back at our drummer Aaron at the time, and he was flagging, and then after we were getting to the end of the set, and I looked over, and, and he, Aaron was just collapsed over the the drum kit. Yeah, they almost just, it. it was it. That was it. Yeah, so he broke our drummer. So I'd like to go back there and just talk to him for a second. How many drinks do you have to sell, dude? The place was like packed. I remember that. Yeah, it was. It was the place was oversold, and it was a really low ceiling, and it was super hot. And then you know we noticed one of the vents was near stage. We're like it's blowing hot air. This is this is gnarly. And like and then I think they was like, oh yeah, sorry, we forgot to turn it off. It, I mean. Played it off as an honest mistake, but yeah, it nearly, nearly broke our drummer. Yeah. Yep. Um, Aaron used to leave blood on the kit, I remember. Yeah, Every cool. show would have more blood on the kit. He, he hit so hard. And they were all rental kits, too, so we'd turn them back <laughs> to the rental house and be like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> and in today's, in COVID era, they probably just burn the drum sets. Seriously, yeah. Wow. Uh, Krista Edwards says, what other musical instruments would you like to learn how to play? I guess piano. Piano would be great. I only play one, so there's so many to choose from. Or oboe. I'd like to play oboe. All right. This is such a sweet sound, but it would take a lifetime. Cello. Oh. 
Nice. Yeah. I don't know. I'd say like maybe like we 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 got a piano. I bought a piano on Craigslist last year, and it's really fun, but I'm not very good at it. So I'd like to get better at that. I'm actually I'm actually recording from a piano. Can you see that? Oh, nice. Yeah, but I can't play it. It's not mine. Uh oh. No, I can't even get back to you guys. I had it balanced on the keys. Okay, there we go. Uh, Eva, Eva Dresselhaus says, if you can go to any concert of any band solo that have ever been, any concert ever, who would you want to see? Who would you want to see? Led Zeppelin. Be mm. Whoa, good choice. Beatles at the Cavern. I would say ACDC. Like, Bon Scott, ACDC, back mm -hmm. when. Like, I, I, saw, I saw a couple, like, some concert footage of theirs, and they just, they just were awesome. So yeah. I'd say, like, proper ACDC. Yeah. I grew up thinking that, they were, that, that the devil had inhabited their brain because I grew up in a small town, conservative small town, and that was devil music. And then I later <laughs> learned that they're the hardest working, in, working band in rock because the way to get that hard sound is all to hit exactly – exactly together and they never stop working on that even i think to this day they're still a hard work hard rehearsing band yeah yeah i don't know how um baked beanie says uh what is your touring schedule in 2021 uh so we don't know uh nope. and then the next question is is the song three about a mother slash son relationship yes all right Luis Robbins says, any plans for coming to tour in the UK? Yes. I mean, no, but we will. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I, I guess no. <laughs> Steven asks, what would be your a cover song you guys would do if you didn't have to pay any royalties? I don't know either. We were talking about a couple, weren't we? Yeah. One of them stood out to me. There's a Hall & Oates one. Rich oh, yeah. Love some hollow notes. Yeah, I, I was, I had a, um, I heard the song Dirty Work by Steely Dan on a show that we were watching a few nights ago, and I thought that, that we would present that really well. I don't know why, I'm not a huge Steely Dan fan, but that song just rules. Yeah. Um, but Steely Dan is great because they, the songs sound happy until you really listen to the lyrics, and you're like, whoa, wow. <laughs> it's not happy at all, yeah. Uh, Kyle Cassidy asks, if you could pick any band or singer to open for, who would it be? I'd be Maroon 5. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go with you, Kevin, just to make it up to, make yeah. it to the band for being a dick. Yeah. Maroon 5. All right, yeah. Open for any band. What do you think, Sullivan? Oh, gosh. Blue Man Group. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, I don't know. I it's Sullivan's joke because my 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 iPad froze. Oh, I said Blue Man Group. There's oh, it's no, really just no, random. No. I saw you a what? of theirs. Okay. Earlier, right on. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, open for any uh, band or singer. It's tough to say. I mean, I don't know. Stevie Wonder would be really fun, just because like. Yeah. I just watched the concert. You know, it's basically what concert do you want to go to after you play? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, that's, that's, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, that'd be, that'd be cool. Uh, Donna Harris says, if you could put three other musicians with <laughs> to form a band, who would it be? No. I refuse. <laughs> Miss Joy. I would not want to be with any other band. I, I And that's, I'm actually not kidding because the, one of the great things about being in Ghost of the Robot is I can bring songs to you guys and you just kind of naturally give the song what I was wanting it to have before I even knew what that was. It's like when I write a song, it's kind of like a chasing a, a ghost through the fog. Like you know it's there, but you don't exactly know what the outlines are, but you know it's already born, but you have to find it. And uh, writing the song is like that way. And then producing a song is a very much the same, where you, you have this sense of, I know what I want, but I can't put it into words. <laughs> and, um, uh, and, but you try. 
But most of the time, I just bring it to you guys and you start playing on it. I'm like, that's, yes, that's, that's what it is. And that's why there, there's very little conflict in the band uh, uh, because of that. We, there's not a lot of disagreement about where a song should be heading. It's like just an organic thing. Yeah. The more you play with other, the same people, you know, you form kind of this collective consciousness, you know, and that's how, that's how some, a band like Led Zeppelin could start improvising. And if Jimmy starts doing something, John Bonham is going to know, oh, I think I know where he's going. And then at the end, they hit together. And it's like, how'd they do that? You know, it's because they have this weird hive mind thing going on. So, And that was a time, too, when all those guys went to, like, private, you know, boarding school where a lot of the curriculum was classical music. Yeah. And mm -hmm. So they grew up playing. They had, they had this crazy, you know, repertoire to, to pull from and they start making rock music together. And it's like, that's, that's how they're so good. I mean, it started at such a young age. Yeah. And that's why like, you know, it just breaks my heart when all these, you know, public school programs get defunded. It's like, no, they, they need that. You don't, you don't know what we're missing out on oh, 20, 30 years later by these kids not being exposed to so much music early on. I don't know. I agree. Uh, hey dude, I think it's about time to call it just because I'm starting to freeze up. Oh, yeah. all right. Well, we the gods um, of technology are killing me. We have we had we have six pages of questions, great questions, and we made it through two pages. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Okay, yeah. we got to do this again. We got to do it a little quicker, or or we need to do it more often. I think yeah. Yeah. So I'm sorry if we didn't get to your question. We'll get to it next time. Yeah. Right well, uh, guys, this is so fun. Yeah, yeah I love hanging out with you guys. And, and hanging out with everybody in the world, man. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, I was not in my house for an hour. I went yeah. elsewhere in my little mind. And uh, that's just a gift, man. I second that. I second that. Right on. Well, so then how hot is it in the room you're in right now? Oh, it's only like 97, 97, 98. Oh, that's, whew, Jesus. Yeah. Okay. And until the sweat starts dripping, then I'll turn the AC on, but. <laughs> wow, you're like a monk. Nah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if they'd let me join the club. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Is All right, guys. The orb of truth. Yes. Thanks All for right, the guys. questions. Oh yeah, hell yeah. Adios, everybody. Yeah, Have a good thanks day. for your questions, man. It's great to hang out with you. Yep. See ya.